Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about wild nature in our backyards and dolphin research with my guest, Dr. Madalena Berlesi. She is the president of the Ocean Conservation Society and is a marine biologist. She has written many books, including Dolphin Confidential, Confessions of a Field Biologist, co-author of Beautiful Minds, The Parallel Lines of Great Apes and Dolphins, and her most recent book, Stranded, Finding Nature in Uncertain Times. Her previous book, Dolphin Confidential, won the 2013 Green Festival Award in the Animal Section, and her Ocean Conservation Society has received a commendation from the City of Los Angeles. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you back on Environmental Directions. Thanks so much for having me. Your work is so important, and your writing about the outdoors, nature, is so lovely and charming. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your latest work, which was written basically during the pandemic when you couldn't go out on your research boat to study your dolphins, but had to go in your backyard and learn about all the wildlife that was sort of being ignored right there where you live. Yes, you're perfectly right. I'm a field marine biologist, so I'm accustomed to spend time out on the water, and that's my most natural state, is being outside, out on the ocean in company of dolphins and whales. And then the pandemic arrive, uh, like everyone else, I came to realize that we're here to stay. So I had no other place to go other than my backyard and my neighborhood here in the suburban Los Angeles. I live near Marina del Rey. So a little bit at the time, I began to reconnect Uh, with the surrounding nature, with the animals that I found uh, near me. But your rediscovery of what's there was not alone. You took your dogs out and they had quite an experience with the lizards and the squirrels and the opossums. Yes, I have uh, a big dog. His uh, name is Genghis, and he's kind of a character uh, in a friend and finding it for a certain time. Because during uh, this period, I always had my dog with me during my walks or in the backyard. So I rediscovered nature with my dog. I also discovered things about my dog, even is with me 24-7, I didn't notice. And I think this happened to many people during the pandemic. We rediscovered things that we never noticed around us. That's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. The dog enjoyed chasing after squirrels, but somehow never succeeded in catching one? Exactly. My dog is very clumsy. We have this war with the squirrel in my backyard, and he tried to catch lizard, but he never got any of them. Actually, once uh, he got stuck in one of the trees, in my backyard with his legs uh, and screaming for help uh, because he was trying to catch a squirrel up on the tree. As a biologist, you're familiar with different species. You pointed out something that people like me in the city don't realize, that some of the squirrels actually aren't native. And in fact, one came from your home country of Italy. Actually, yeah, now there are two species here. We have the eastern fox squirrel. Uh, they are an invasive species. And then we have the western gray squirrel. Uh, they are the species that is local here, indigenous. In Italy, we have another species that's a gray squirrel. It's kind of the opposite what's going on in my country because the grays in uh, Europe is the invasive uh, and uh, the red squirrel uh, are uh, the one there 
are indigenous. So it's kind of the opposite there. Yes, here in LA, there is a war going on between these two squirrels. They're invasive, they're very opportunistic, very adaptable, they reproduce like rabbits. So they tend to take over the poor gray squirrel that they don't know where to go anymore. Their space is getting more and more reduced and they are starting to mate with each other. So we have a hybridization and that's a problem when you have invasive species. You mentioned habitat and you live in Marina del Rey and there was a very large wetland at one time, Bayona wetland, which has been significantly reduced by commercial development, housing, business, roads. You pointed out that there's still a little bit remnant left. Environmentalists weren't too successful in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to save this area, but wetlands are so important. They're on the Pacific Flyway. The marine life actually comes into the wetlands. Tell us what is there? Unfortunately, little remains of what this magnificent wetland used to be, as you mentioned, was the Pacific Flyway. So a lot of birds that migrate for thousands of miles were stopping in the Bayona wetlands to feed and rest. And now little remains. Yes, there are still some birds you can see here. On, you can see different species of birds, but really little remain. And to me, it's really sad because when I moved here from Italy, back in 1996, I was involved in trying to stop development. This is unfortunate for Los Angeles. What about the predatory birds like the hawks? They are still here, and I talk about some of the hawks in the book. You can see them, especially above Playa Vista. They have nests there. But again, there are many species of hawks are gone. There is a lot less left than there used to be. You pointed out in your book an interesting phenomena, and that is because the streets, the towns were not as busy as they are when we don't have a lockdown, that some of the wildlife actually started coming into these areas and roaming the streets. Even without the lockdown, I see coyotes in my neighborhood. What other animals were able to come out of the natural areas into the urban areas? I think a lot of them with people in lockdown, nature kind of rebounded over around us. I noticed things I never noticed before, so I rediscovered how to listen to the sound of birds, and I saw a blackbird in my backyard that I haven't seen before. Usually they stay close to the wetland that, that we were describing before. You mentioned coyotes. Coyotes, they started to come closer and closer with us inside the houses. I saw more uh, desert cottontails. I saw more rattlesnakes, <laughs> more squirrels than I usually see. So this is just around us, but everywhere in the world you have this news uh, of nature coming closer uh, to humans in the cities, like in Santiago de Chile you have pumas in the city, in London there was a fox walking on the street with less noise in the ocean, even cetaceans like whales and dolphins rebounded. You can hear them better because there was not less noise in the ocean. With the pandemic we basically see how nature can come back if we take ourselves a little bit out of the equation if if we create less damage. In one of your chapters, you were rather annoyed with some of your neighbors on the internet who were objecting to the coyotes in their neighborhood. Yes, it's true, because I love coyotes. I was reading next door, and there were all these comments during the pandemic, how we have to build a wall to protect ourselves from coyotes, how we need to put Kevlar suit on our Pomeranians, how coyotes are among us and are here to kill us. And I think it's crazy, because first of all, coyotes are as wary of us than we are of them. They became mostly nocturnal, because of us, so it's not that you see them every day on the street. I feel bad for people that lost their pet, but at the same time, I really believe that we need to find a way to cohabitate, to coexist, and we need to make an effort, and we can do a lot of things, covering our trash, keeping our pets inside if there is a coyote around, being our yard clean from the remains of, of food, and there is no reason not to be wary of them. They tend to to stay on their own for the most part. They are amazing animals. They need respect. We need to understand them better and 
really learn uh, how to coexist. I enjoy seeing some of the wildlife in my backyard. I see occasionally the opossum, yet I can't quite ever figure out where they are sleeping during the day. I can't find them, but I enjoy when they're roaming around. And opossums have a rather bad reputation because they sort of look like a big rat, and people don't like that. But your dog found a baby opossum, and you thought that it actually had died, but opossums do play dead. And all of a sudden, it exactly. comes back to life after a few hours? Yes, as you mentioned, opossum are amazing animals that are completely misunderstood. Dude, they are not dangerous at all. People are scared because they have this rat-looking appearance. They have these 50 intimidating teeth, but it's nothing. Really, they have a very nice demeanor, and they're an amazing animal to discover. Yes, during the pandemic with my dog, we observe, I call him Opus the Opossum. My dog once got a little baby opossum in his mouth, and he was shaking his opossum, and I got really nervous. I took him out of his mouth, and then the opossum, I speak. I thought I'll start playing that. Then I thought, well, I wait, I wait, I wait. And I know they play possum, but it was over six hours. So I told my husband, I think this possum is dead. And so I went outside very sad trying to pick him up. And little possum just move away. And I am for leaving animals alone, even in an urban environment like mine. So I let it go. Who knows? Hopefully the little possum survive. It was an interesting experience. And the way that you write about these experiences is so delightful and informative, but pleasurable at the same time. In your new book, Stranded, Finding Nature in Uncertain Times, and we'll return in a moment with my guest, Dr. Madalena Berzi, to talk more about nature in our lives. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Dr. Madalena Bertzi. She is president of the Ocean Conservation Society. Right now, we're talking about some of the animals that you discovered in your backyard a little bit more because you had the time to look and watch them because you weren't out doing your dolphin research, which we're going to talk about because you have one of the longest dolphin research projects in the world here in Southern California. But... I want you to talk about an insect that most people are very scared about, but in reading your book, I discovered that not all wasps are dangerous, and they are fascinating. Tell us about the wasp on your lounge chair. So I was in my backyard eating an avocado toast. All of a sudden, I see this paper wasp landing on the avocado. Paper wasp, as you mentioned, people are very afraid of wasps, but for no reason, because of thousands of species that we have have here in the United States, now many are dangerous to humans. And they are extremely interesting animal to observe. This one that ended up on my avocado toast was particularly interesting because she left my toast with a little bit of avocado attached to her legs, was a female, near my lounge chair. So I was observing the movement. I discovered that she was one of the entry guard for a nest that was located inside the canvas of my lounge chair. So I started observing her and with the other wasp going back and forth to the nest. And I started thinking about these paper wasps, like how they build these nests. They are really an architectural marvel made of wood. The female chew with their strong mandibles for anything that it's woody. And then they create this pulpy paste. They make this amazing nest. Their social behavior is incredible because these societies, for instance, have more than one queen. And they have the ability to recognize themselves. They have ability of facial recognition. It's really weird to think about an animal like a wasp, but they have a brain is a million the size of ours, can recognize faces. I was thinking about how I recognize bottlenose dolphins by their dorsal fin and also how the face of bottlenose dolphin can help to recognize this animal. The more we learn about any animals, we discover all these things about bees and wasps and lizards that we didn't know before. And what did you discover about the lizards? 
Well, the lizards for me are extremely fascinating because I study lizard for my bachelor thesis in Italy. I was studying a lizard called Podarchis sicular. There is the Italian wall lizard. There is an invasive species in California. So I did my entire bachelor thesis on the home range and homing of lizards. And then I forgot about lizards because I studied sea turtles, I studied dolphins and whales that kind of went up the evolutionary scale. And during the pandemic, sitting in my backyard, I basically rediscovered lizard and was fascinating because I completely forgot about these animals and now here they were keeping me in company during the pandemic in my backyard so I started observing the species there were around me and I have a scientist friend at Bloomstein at UCLA that does some study on lizards he was telling me how urban lizards have shorter legs especially the one of the species that we found here there is the western fence lizard have shorter legs and they adapt to have shorter legs to live in the urban environment, which I thought was very fascinating. You also reconnected with your dolphins in the wild after the lockdown was over and you were able to take your research boat out with your wonderful, dedicated volunteers with your organization to document what they are doing. But I found the one point that we didn't discuss in our last interview, and that is the problem of dolphins in captivity. And you experienced the lockdown during the pandemic and thought about your dolphins and how horrible it was for these animals to be in very small tanks in sea aquariums. These are animals that can travel 100 miles a day, like to be in family groups. Tell me more about why we should eliminate dolphins in captivity and protect them in the wild. What we know now about the dolphins, there is really no reason to keep them in captivity. You know, maybe captivity was more justified decades ago when we didn't know anything about what these animals are about and how they live. If you observe animals in the wild, dolphins in the wild, like I did for the last 30 years of my life, you can't even imagine how these animals can live in a tank because they need space to live. They are extremely social animals that need the companion. They travel for miles and miles. They have this strong relationship. Their society are very complex. They are in many ways similar to us. This is something I talk about in Beautiful Minds, the parallel lives of the great tapes and dolphins and also in Dolphin Confidential. When I found myself closing my house during the pandemic, I really had this sense of felt claustrophobic almost. And I started thinking about how this animal can feel in captivity. And one of them in particular came to mind, and it's Lolita. Lolita now is 57 years old. She's at the Miami Sea Aquarium in Florida. She's been in captivity since the early 70s. So this animal has spent most of her life closing a tank. This is an orca. In a tank, when she stands up, the tank is as long as she is. There is no cover from the sun. And I went there to observe this animal a few years ago when they were talking about releasing Lolita. They asked for expertise. And it was one of the most heartbreaking experiences of my life because you can really see the sufferance in this animal. You can see everything that is taken away from these animals. It's like living in solitary confinement in a jail cell for years and years and years. These animals certainly are wonderful to look at in the wild. Bring us up to date on your research because you have been going out in the Pacific Ocean here documenting the wild dolphins. What new discoveries have you made? One of the most important things we are doing right now is a big collaboration with other scientists along the California coast. This is not just me. Usually working with a lot of other scientists that you get most of out of your data. We put all our data together to study the movements and the behavior of dolphins along the entire California coast because coastal bottlenose dolphins, they are the ones that you can see if you go to the beach every day, move from Baja California up to Northern California, past San Francisco. So putting together all our data thanks to photo identification, we have a better idea 
idea of their movement. Now we know how long they take to go from one place to another one, how long they stay in the Santa Monica Bay versus in the San Diego area. So we are learning more and more about this population. And the most important thing is, is this data allow us to better protect the species that move really close to shore. In addition to that, I continue to study the behavior of different species, but also with our nonprofit, we have environmental programs because research is important, but protecting the animals we study is even more important than the environment. We're doing this Be Whale Aware campaign to tell people, yes, go out and see blue whales. They are here right now, for instance, and gray whales and dolphins, but maintain a distance from them. These animals need their space. And also a Be Balloon Aware campaign, which I also talk about on the book, because we threw all these balloons in the world. They end up in the water when we have parties. These are dangerous to animals. Let's be sure to keep those balloons indoors and not outdoors where they can get loose and the animals might ingest them thinking they're food. Or use alternative things. They are not balloons. Part of your dolphin research is taking photographs of what dolphins are there. You can identify them because of their fins. How many are there in our Santa Monica Bay here in Southern California? Are the numbers threatened? Are they in danger? Are they okay in terms of population numbers? The problem is we really don't know if they are okay or not. Pollution is a huge issue as is overfishing. The coastal population of bottlenose dolphins right now is less than 500 individuals that move up and down the coast. For the offshore population, we really don't know. You are studying the bottlenose dolphin here. Do other dolphins come in? You mentioned orcas. They were from the Pacific Northwest. There are uh, many different species of dolphins and whales that visit the Santa Monica Bay. Bottlenose dolphins are the ones that we see more often, but there are common dolphins, Pacific white-sided dolphins. Uh, occasionally there are orcas, there are gray whales, fin whales, there are uh, humpback whales, blue whales. Some are more frequent in the bay, some are uh, more occasional. Is there enough food for them? Because we mentioned the problem with balloons and also we have sewage treatment plants often overflows is that a pollution problem is the overfishing so serious that the dolphins and the whales aren't getting enough to eat the short answer i would say yes pollution and overfishing are a huge problem more for some species instead than others and more in other areas than here but also in california we see a lot of problem with gray whales and other species and some things I see and they nourish individuals as well. What are your goals in the next couple of years in terms of what you're trying to discover and document in your research? One of the biggest goals is continue to share data with other scientists so we can have a better understanding on the bottom of dolphins population as well as other species along the California coast. You wrote in your book, most of your friends asked, what can I do? So, what can people do? I think you shouldn't limit yourself to recycle or click online to support somebody else's action. Those are all good things, but are not enough. We need the real action. I think you should get involved in issuing your community and then involve other people and then call your representative to resolve an issue because we need more political action. We need to change how our leader to have more and more green leaders that can resolve the problem we are having right now. Because you run a non-profit organization and function on very limited resources, unfortunately grants are not always available to do the research necessary. You depend on help from volunteers. I found it interesting that you pointed out that not everybody is geared to do the detailed work that is required to be a dolphin researcher. They might love the dolphins, want to go out and see them, but what do your volunteer assistants do when you're out on the water? They do a lot of stuff. And research requires a lot of effort and a lot of passion. So 
if you are passionate, if you are interested in nature, if you are willing to work hard, it's an amazing opportunity. It requires training because you need to learn from driving a boat to taking data with computers, to do photo ID, all, all kind of stuff. Many people think that you go out and you look at dolphin and that's it and all it's wonderful. But a few researchers there with me for many, many years and they are extremely motivated, extremely passionate. They put everything they have into this and I truly appreciate their work. Since dolphins do travel, they don't stay in one small little area in the bay, you must look forward to being able to rediscover them when they come back. Yes, absolutely. And some of these dolphins are also out for adoption in our website, oceanconservation.org, because we see them over time and we give them name. I actually give them Italian names. One is called Mozza, sure from mozzarella, one of my favorite foods. So we see the same dolphins over time and we do recognize them. Jane Goodall, world famous primatologist who studied the chimpanzees, was one of the first field research scientists to give names to her subjects that she was studying rather than numbers. You just mentioned that you name your research subjects rather than give them numbers. Is that now accepted in the scientific world? I think it's more accepted. I think some scientists still are resisting that. I think we shouldn't just name only dolphins or great apes, but also lizards or any animal. They need as much respect as we do, and that's something that I stress in the book, how we need to respect nature. We need nature, and we can't survive without nature, so we need to learn to better live in nature. And your description of how the mother dolphins stay with the young that may not survive and they just don't want to leave their young calves that have died is just so moving and so sad. Yeah, yeah, dolphins grieve as we do or not exactly as we do but they tend to grieve. We don't know exactly how they do it but we start to have a glance into that too because the mother stay near the body of another dead calf uh, or, or her calf for a long time. She refused to eat. She refused to go back with her school for days. So we start learning more and more about the similarities that these animals have with us and the emotion that they have as well. One of the chapters in your book is titled Apocalypse Now. Are we really seriously that endangered on this planet? Short answer, yes. I think climate change is a huge issue. We've talked so much about the animals that you observed and wrote about yet you also found out about plants because you couldn't get out on the ocean so you went into your backyard and planted some plants your mother in Italy had plants and you enjoyed some of those what plant life did you create again when I look at animals I still have my scientist coat on because I look at them I observe them I think about questions and I think gardening is very different because gardening for me is very relaxing my mom has a big green thumb. She's amazing with gardening and I never thought I'd be any good at this. But during the pandemic, I started to look at the plants that I have here and I live in a rental home. It was all grass, had a lot of flowers and trees that require a lot of water. So I thought maybe I should create a garden that is more in tune with Los Angeles landscape, the desert landscape. So I wanted to use only non-invasive species, only local species that require little water or no water at all. Because there was the pandemic, I couldn't and I didn't want to buy plants because I think I'm really for recycling things. So I discovered next door, and this case was a, a positive thing, to discover that a lot of people were giving away plants. So I started collecting plants in a three miles radius from cacti to aloes plants, anything that they were giving away, any type of succulents. I plant rosemary and lupines from hummingbirds. It was fun reading about your garden and your experiences during the pandemic discovering the nature right there at your own home and your own neighborhood. I'd like to thank you so very much for sharing with us your wonderful stories. It's a book that can just be read a few pages at a time and enjoy the experience that you had with all these different animals here in our urban environment. Thank you so very much for
for being my guest. Thanks so much for having me. I have been speaking with Dr. Madalena Berosi, who is the president of the Ocean Conservation Society, a marine biologist, and author of Stranded, Finding Nature in Uncertain Times. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.